Thank you, Lord Jesus. Father, we thank you tonight in the name of the Lord Jesus that you have intervened on our behalf. In the heavenlies, you've been pleased by our praise, which was critical. No man has exalted man, but we've exalted you, the Lord of Lords, the King of Kings. We stand in awe of your goodness toward the children of men. Now, great Father, stretch forth thine hand to heal, that signs and wonders may be granted. In the ground, in the brass, the man, in the sea, perhaps the two more may be beached in Pakistan. And the magnificent. What are you doing in this place, brother? <laughs> Hallelujah. Thank God for the Lord. Amen. Thank you, Father. Thank you, Father. Amen. I'm going to switch my phone. He's going to shout. Amen. 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 Well, that's better. Praise God. They told me that the red line, if I step over there, I have a radio program. So I better back up a little bit. Amen. Give myself some, some running room. <laughs> well, you love the Lord tonight. Just, Brother Mike, pipe me down a little bit. I'm a little hot right now. If I get happy at this volume, I'm going to pop something. Amen. I'm going to pop up. Glory to God. Amen. Again, we're so thankful uh, for the opportunity to be with you tonight. At the behest of the Holy Ghost and your pastor, uh, we just kind of meshed and, and, and met, like I said, a couple of years ago, dear honey, and uh, and we had an opportunity to come through and have lunch with him, Sister Vicky, and it's just what, just we knew that uh, this type of folk we want to hang out with. People that love the Lord with all their heart, amen. Serious, I mean, you go back across, across the pond like this man and this woman do, you know, you've got to be serious about things of God. So, we salute you for your efforts and what you've done for 30 years, and that which shall be done in the days to come. So we'll endeavor to throw another log on this hot burning fire. Amen? Amen. Amen. <laughs> Turn in your Bibles, if you will, and we'll see what we can get through this without me just having a Pentecostal fit. Amen? Won't guarantee that, though. All right? Philemon, the book of Philemon, of Philemon, if you Greek scholar, Correct me if not, just find it and read. Amen. <laughs> anyway, so we'll get over here and we'll look at verse number uh, four in the book of Philemon. I just want to encourage you tonight and, 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 and something that has been stirring to me for about five years and is to produce great fruit. And maybe we'll get to talk about that at the end. But anyway, look at verse number four. I thank my God, make a mention of thee always in my prayers. Hearing of thy love and faith which thou hast toward the Lord Jesus and toward all saints. Everybody say all saints. all saints. Now that's really very important. The Spirit of God has included that, particularly embedded in the, the principle of this particular letter. It's one letter, one page. You obviously know that. He goes on to say that the communication of thy faith may become effectual or effective by the acknowledging of every good thing which is in you, yes. in Christ Jesus. I'd like to take the time to focus on that preposition in, and really it should be translated by. Yes. So all things that you got that came through and or by Christ Jesus was being highlighted here. And the Bible tells us that we can talk about those things and acknowledge those things. For that to happen, you've got to know that you have it. Ephesians 4 and verse number 5. One Lord, one faith, one baptism. One God and Father of all, who is above all, and through all, and in you all. Yeah. We got God the Son on the inside of us. Now we got God the Father on the inside of us. We've already messed up the religious dogmatic people. We've already turned their, their, you know, their wagon upside down. Because we've got an indwelling Father. The context is talking about the Father of God, not the Son of Jesus Christ. Amen. Can you say amen? amen. Well, it's inclusive of, but I'm limited to Him. Yes. That's good enough, isn't it? Amen. Well, let's go on and find out something else. Let's go to Romans chapter number 8. Hallelujah. Romans chapter number 8. 
And uh, we'll work our way down here to get, we, we, we're still in introduction mode right now, okay? Romans chapter number 8, verse number 9. Romans 8 and 9. But ye are not in the flesh, but in the spirit. If so be, if it's a contingent partisan, in the event that this is the case. If so be that the spirit of God dwells in you. So we got God the Father, God the Son, and God the Spirit. Yeah. On the inside of every belief. Yes. Yes. I can talk about that. <laughs> Why? Because the word says that's what's on the inside of me. Yeah. Yeah. I can acknowledge that. Yeah. I can talk about that. I don't have to talk about it from some intellectual perspective or platform. I can take them right to the word and show this to them. That's right. And when you said Christ is in me, most people will think about the physical man, Jesus. Mm -hmm. They'll think immediately. Uh, and they don't know anything about religion, or not even about faith, you know, you kind of got them on their heels. They go, okay, okay, I heard about that Jesus Christ. He is in you, right. Now you've got an entrance. You can see the quandary in their little beady eyes. <laughs> and say amen. And you capitalize on it immediately. <laughs> Let me explain what I mean by that. Because if Christ is five feet nine, and my wife is six feet two. What? Amen. He, well, no, no, no. He can, he, 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 you are five feet three and a half, right? Yes. So if Christ is five feet five, he won't fit in her. So he cannot be talking about his physical. So now we can bring them to the realization as to how Christ dwells. In us. And we're right here in the scripture because look at what it says now. He says, Now, if any man have not the Spirit of Christ, uh oh, contextually, he's referencing the Spirit of God. In the very same paragraph, he says, Now, if you don't have the Spirit of Christ, but it just said the Spirit of God dwells in you. So the Spirit of Christ and the Spirit of God must be synonymous. And how does Christ dwell in us? By his Spirit, which is the Spirit of God. Can you say amen? This is, this, this, this is just what's in us. And if that were the case, people could sit down all day long and be ministered to that have no understanding about this by people who just look at these three scriptures. Because they'll lead you to other places, and this is not exhausted by any means. But let's go, go, go to uh, uh, 1 Peter chapter number 3. And now uh, we got, so we can say right now, God dwells in us by His Spirit, which is the Spirit of Christ. Or God the Father dwells in us by His Spirit, the Spirit of God, the Spirit of Christ. So we can answer those questions. I may as well stop here and <laughs> When you teach the Word of God accurately, you autonomously or automatically pull out the pillars of wrong doctrine. I'll say it again. If you teach the word of God correctly, you need, you need not anti-teach anything. Whatever subject is being referenced, you just teach the word of God from it and pulls the pillars out of the fall of doctrine automatically. Can you say amen? Such as with this case, because people could take things out of context. One Lord, one faith, one baptism. Just that scripture alone. We could take it out of context all of a sudden. You know, there's no other baptism other than the baptism of the Holy Ghost. Now you've got to be saved by the baptism of the Holy Ghost. No, you get saved, and then you get baptized with the Holy Ghost. Salvation comes before you get baptized with the Holy Ghost. Baptizing with the Holy Ghost does not make you saved. It's because you're already saved. You say, man, you become a candidate for that. So we can take these things out of context and say what we want to say with them. But if you keep it in context, you're going to pull the pillar out of false doctrine every time. Amen? Amen. Now, having said that, let's go to 1 Peter chapter number 3. And we're going to run down this little list here. Uh, these things, I, I'll tell you what, what it does for me. I got over here, and, and I may as well tell you how, how I minister, or so I minister. It's not that I go and, and, and look up something and try to figure out what it means or get a sermon on. Everything that I minister comes from my fellowship of the Holy Ghost. 
I mean, every day I'm in this book and I don't get there to find a sermon. I get there to fellowship with him. Amen. And he'll point things out. Here are the things that he points out most often. When I'm ministering, I'm not ministering to you from the standpoint of you need this, I'm going to teach it to you. It's because he magnifies to me the deficiency in my own life concerning that particular subject. I'll say it again. The reason I can share this with you is because the Spirit of God mirrored to me and showed me my lack of understanding concerning these issues myself. And when I've got the understanding of it, I've got to share it. So I'm not a shy man. All right then, verse number 15, 1 Peter chapter 3. But sanctify the Lord God in your hearts and be ready always to give an answer to every man that asketh you a reason of or for the hope that is in you with meekness and with fear. Well now, it's obvious has been to me, I'm sure to you, that sometimes you've encountered people and they seem to have had more knowledge than you of the Bible. Ever been there? Yes. And when you maybe tried to share something with them, they came back with a rebuttal. Yeah. They came back with a higher level of understanding and you very likely pulled the curtain down on that conversation and exit it stays left. <laughs> Because you perceive that they have more understanding than you, and you shut down. Mm -hmm. Well, it never happened to anybody in this one of the streets. Mm -hmm. mm -hmm. The reason you want to exit is because you think you're in over your head. Yeah. Never. Only talk about what you know that you have. Don't let anybody bully you off of the things that you already have in Christ Jesus. Yeah. Can you say amen? Mm -hmm. Well then, but you ought to be ready always to give an answer to not every other man, not every two, three men, but every man that asks you a reason why you believe what you believe. That's all to say. A reason for the hope that's within you. And the Bible says you've got the God kind of hope. That's not a hit or miss. It's a confident expectation. Your hope in God it's based on the fact that you're expecting to see what your hope is geared toward. Mm -hmm. You're looking for it. Yeah. It's not a surprise when it shows up. Can you say amen? Yeah. So then, I've not been always ready to give an, an, an answer to every man that asks me why I believe what I believe. And this is not, watch this, this is not 1980 I'm talking about. This is, 19, this is post Bible school sometimes. <laughs> This is after I was graduated and anointed and appointed and ordained. Because some folk do nothing but study the Bible to try and trip Christians up. And I remember this feeling when I did not respond appropriately. It was a sour spirit feeling in my gut. I said, I'm not going to ever go there again. Amen? Now, and when folk ring my doorbell on Saturday morning that I'm home, there is ring no long doorbell. <laughs> And they're soon going to find that out. And I'll use the subterfuge that they try to use and bandit the name of Jesus about and draw them in with a big net and pounce on them. <laughs> Amen? Amen? And I begin to tell them why. All I'm telling them is why I believe what I believe. And I'm backing them up by the Word of God. But they don't know they search trying to find out whether you know the Word of God or not before they open up their mouths. And they think you're ignorant, they just go for it. And that's their noose. Glory to God. Amen? And the next thing you know, I'm popping their bag, having their lunch, and popping their bag and sitting them on down the street. All right. Now, so then, here's this hope that's on the inside of you. But, you know, these are, these are things that are very limited in, in our scope tonight. You're going to find tens of more of things that are in you that came by Christ Jesus, and we could even cover tonight. And when you find them, put them in your arsenal. I've got this and I've got that on the inside. Amen? Amen? And it came by Christ Jesus. Go to 1 John chapter 2 for an instance. 1 John chapter 2. I know it's a midweek and, and you know we don't want to keep you too long. We've got to have you out by midnight. We will. Amen? Amen. <laughs> Praise the Lord. Alright. 1 John chapter 2. Verse number 27. 
but the anointing of the living God, which he has received of him abideth. That means it remains, continues, and it stays. I know you've heard, I have, over the years, statements kind of like this. Well, they lost their anointing. You ever heard somebody say something like that? Yeah. Well, you know, they said that because they've, they've viewed somebody who may have been used of the Lord mightily in some time. All of a sudden, they're on the sidelines now, the spiritual jumping, baby. And, and because they're not active in ministry, that's one scenario. And because people know historically as to what the cause of that is and or was, they deduce that they've lost their anointing. But I come to tell you that ain't even possible. They're supposed to hear. It ain't even remotely possible. Why? Because the Bible just told me so. The anointing which you received of him continues, remains, and it stays. That's what abideth means. A present participle. It's abiding. In you. Not on you. In you. Yeah. And you need not that any man teach you, but the same, as the same one ought to teach you all things, and there's no lie. And it's true that there's no lie. Even as it hath taught you, you shall abide in him. Yeah. Well, the abiding fact of the anointing tells me something. I may have missed the mark. Now, this is no license here to go out and act like a nerd in the house of God. Amen? <laughs> but I'm telling you right now, we've swept too many people under the rug because they missed it and we've let, let them know that they are the ones who cannot ever recover. The bottom line is the anointing never dissipates. The anointing never goes away. The anointing never ceases. Now here's the other scenario that's not so good. Many have found that out. Who have missed the mark badly, and rather than sit on the side and be restored, they continue. And that's what happens. The anointing continues to work. I've seen it, I've shook my head. Good Lord, before I understand, how could that be? Because I know so and so. I know what this, and I, yeah, yeah. But do you know the anointing remains and never dissipates? Now here is a case that we talked about concerning this, and I was mentioning along these lines. And there was a pastor down in Mobile, Alabama, or several in Alabama. He said, you know what? He said, you know, I know that's true because I went to so-and-so school. And another statement went in this one. And Brother Hagin used to talk about this man. He said they went to him and talked to him on a number of occasions, straightened up their life. If you don't, you're going to die early. Told him, in a year you'll be dead. Or something along that line. This guy said, yeah, but I can't. This guy had a problem with alcohol. And this man had gone to his school. He said, we watched him. He said, he'd come in and he'd got that fan in him, trying to get him to come out of that stupor, drunken stupor, so he could smell the alcohol in his breath, that he'd pour all kinds of stuff in him. He had the meaning. The meaning is about to take place. Folk have driven up in, in ambulances and wheelchairs and they're out there. And he's in there in a stupor. He said he hit that stage and sober up like that. Lay hand, people would get out of the wheelchair, all kinds of stuff going on. How can that be? The anointing. The anointing. But here's the problem. He died just like Brother Heaven said. And others who have left here and left their giftedness, and God can use them to the degree that he can use them. And when they use their own bodies up, what can he do? Mm -hmm. Are you getting what I'm talking about here? Yeah. Every one of those who would not corral their flesh yeah. left here and left that ministry to somebody else because God used them as much, much as he could. Why? Because the anointing remains. And I would rather... Go with the scriptural principle of what a long life will satisfy me and show me his salvation by corralling my flesh. Somebody shout amen here by walking upright before the Lord of glory and be doing things as honest in the sight of all men. Amen. I thought I'd never early on glory.
with God. Amen. Uh -huh. Now, we're the first God, are we not? Yes. Let's go to the fifth chapter. Praise God for everyone. Just a little encouragement tonight. First John chapter 5. Let's read verse number 9. It says here, If we receive the witness of men, the witness of God is greater. There must be a witness of men there, right? But the witness of God is greater. For this is the witness of God. He's going to define what the witness is, first of all. This is the witness of God which, which he had testified of his son. He, is the definition, he that believeth on the Son of God hath, Mr. Britain has, has the witness in himself. So, the witness, all witnesses testify. All witness, the word witness means to co-note together with. You can't have a witness on your behalf who says something other than, says something other than what you say. The witness co-notes together with you. What he knows, you know, and what you know, he knows, and you both say the very same thing. That's a witness. Amen? So then, there's a witness that verifies that you belong to God. That's what he's talking about. You believe it on him, and you've got a knowing on the inside of you, a testimony, a testifier, that says you're a child of God. Hallelujah. Not somebody sitting you on a mourner's bench. Mm. Not somebody saying, I thank you, God, and maybe you don't. Mm. Amen? But the witness testifying on the inside of your very belly that you're born again. Oh, yeah. Somebody shout amen. amen. Well, that's wonderful for me to say that, but it's better for the Holy Ghost to say it. Yeah. Let's go to the 8th chapter of Romans again. Amen. Romans chapter number 8. <laughs> look at this. Now you know this will help us to look at it again. It says here in verse number 16, the Spirit should be himself. The Spirit Himself beareth. Beareth witness with our head. Now, with our spirit, that we are the children, the technon of God. That's what he's talking about in 1 John 5 and 10. There's a testifier, there's a testimony on the inside of you that says, Child of God, that's who you are. Yes. No outside verification whatsoever. Somebody ought to shout glory now. Yeah. Glory. Now then. Glory. It says here in the 17th verse, and if children, then heirs, and heirs of God, and joint heirs with Jesus Christ. Hallelujah. Oh. You are a co-heir with Jesus himself. And how do you know that? There's somebody testifying to that fact. The Holy Ghost himself bears witness with you. If they were with you in the court today, if you were in the court today and said, I call the Holy Ghost to witness, I'm born again. Yep, yes, he is. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. 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 So you don't have to go outside for that. For nobody. You can tell me I'm not a millionaire today. You can tell me I don't own four houses, one in Miami, one in Denver, one in Los Angeles, one in the Oklahoma. And you'd be right. But you can't tell me. That I'm not born again. You can't tell me that I'm not a child of God. You can't tell me that I, I you know, you might be, no, I got a witness testimony that's greater than you. Hallelujah. Somebody shout in their head. Oh, I'll let go of this in my head. You can help a bit right on the other Now look at this. Look at the 14th person. Let's go back and look at something here. For as many as are led by the Spirit of God, they are the sons of God. This is the point here to help. Sons of God and children of God are not the same. Children of God are not necessarily sons of God, but sons of God have to have been a child of God. And the difference in those two words will help you immensely. This word technology I just talked about in children here, a child of technology. That means a mere fact of birth. 
It means that you're in the kingdom of God and you belong to God because you are heir and are doing it with Jesus Christ. So it's 17 chapter 17 verse. But it doesn't mean that you are a son of God. Now, son, we know, is, is a kind of generic term that's being used here. But really, when we look at the word in the Greek, it's the word wheels, H-U-I-S-O-S. -S, and it stresses the mature believer. Amen. This is only referencing in all of the Bible, wherever you see it, Jesus himself or a mature believer. It's never talking about a mere fact of birth or someone that just, I, I was not a son of God for 30 years. Well, let's put from, from 14 to 34, let's put it that way. And from 34 on, I began to be a son of God and began to mature. Amen. Because, watch this, I'll go back to the 14th verse. This denotes something. For as many as are led by the Spirit of God, which means not all are. But those that are, are able to be led by the Son of God. They, they are called sons of God. They are called sons of God. So by definition, if one cannot be led by the Spirit of God, they cannot be a son of God. But that does not mean they're not a child of God. In root to maturity. Can you say amen? amen? Now what's happening, obviously, is that we are seeing the Bible tell us, mirror to us, what or who we are. We're not deducing on our own. That's what religion does. Religion tells you what you are and what you're not. But the Bible is the one that the Bible itself validates who you are. Oh, Lord. <clears throat> Go to the fifth chapter of Hebrews. Just because of another teaching doesn't help us tonight. Amen. We're winding down. Takes me a while to wind down. Go to that. Look at what he says here in verse number one of the fifth chapter. Fifth chapter. He says here in the thirteenth verse. Use it milk. Again, use it, E-T-H, always as a present participle. Term of antiquity, Elizabethan. For everyone that continues or always uses, stays long. The milk is unsuccessful or unskillful, rather, in the word of righteousness. Now stop. Didn't Peter tell us the desire to sense the milk of the word that we might go there by? Yes. And it's not wrong to be on milk. Unless you've been on it too long. Unless you should have been off the milk by now. I'm just about to give that cost away by that. In other words, if you stay on the milk, you've been, I've been born again, uh, 30 something years. And uh, my memory verse says, Jesus wept. You are in trouble. <laughs> you are in big trouble. Because you're still on the milk of the world. Amen. And you're unskillful. And the word of righteousness. So look at the next part of it. But strong meat, the longer the men that are of full age, even those, what says, who by reason of use have their spirits exercised to discern both the have their what? Have their what? Senses. Senses. This is not a shandai thing. This is not a I, when you mature in the things of God. One of the first indications of mature is that you don't have to pray about everything. <laughs> when y'all stop shouting, I'm going to tell you. Say on. There's some stuff you don't have to pray about. The mature believer doesn't have to go into the prayer shack every time something comes up. Because he's embedded with principles that yeah. came from the Word of God and forth by his love for Jesus Christ. Hallelujah. And in so doing, these are already things that are answered. Yeah. You don't even have to wonder why. Because, watch this, he can discern this thing between good and evil to his senses. Mm. And that's the power of the Word in one's life. It develops us into maturity so that we can have a, some, somewhat of a... We really should be on automatic most of the time. We should not... You know, a, a pastor, this to me, one of the pastors in Los Angeles, in California, 
He said, you know you're a Christian when you hit your shin on a, on, on, on a bumper, trailer bumper hitch. And you, and you don't say something. I said, excuse me, my test of my Christianity is more powerful. Message boy, the message girl. 
Can you say amen? He says, he that heareth you, heareth me. He that despises you, despises me. On the other hand, don't take it personal. Don't you even let, I mean, the foulest thing will come when you try to share faith with somebody. And they're not aiming at you. They're aiming at the Christ in you. Amen. He goes on to say here, he says, and he that despises me, despises him that sent me. Yeah. One more scripture. Go to the 10th chapter of Matthew. This is kind of a pattern of this right here. And we'll end here. Matthew 10 and verse number 20. Oh, hallelujah. For it is not ye that speak. Oh, stop. He that heareth you, you must be speaking. If somebody's hearing you, you must be speaking. Yeah. But you, but what this is it? For it is not ye that speak, but the spirit of your father which speaketh in you. So not only are you, are you if your mouth being filled with the right words at the time, but the despising of your words, if they are despised, is not aimed at you. And if you can remove yourself from the picture in that respect, your witnessing will increase a hundredfold. Because the thing that inhibits witnessing is the fear of rejection. And if you don't fear being rejected because it's not you that's being rejected, you'll do it that much more. Can you say it again? Let's stand. Father, I thank you tonight in the name of the Lord Jesus Christ for the tenderness of this people, for this form of truth, this arena of faith, where you sent your word, and it can be spoken without reservation based upon what you've done these 30 odd years. We thank you in advance that this will be in fertile soil, and the goodness of the Lord Jesus Christ will manifest in divers ways among this people, the sheepfold. That in days to come, they'll be emboldened by your spirit concerning these things that they can talk about what they already have in you. I thank you, Father, in the name of the Lord Jesus, that these hearing ears have now put themselves in position of vulnerability and to take this chance, as it were, to test out this word for themselves. And in the days to come, people will bow their knee, bow their head, and receive the Lord Jesus as their personal Savior at the behest of this people. And the kingdom of God shall be increased, and great shall be the joy in the vineyard thereof. For that we give you all the glory and the honor and the praise in the wonderful name of the Lord Jesus Christ. Hallelujah. Amen.